Okay, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker today. So welcome, Dr. Gallimore, and welcome, everyone. Uh, today's talk will be recorded, and so we please ask you to keep your microphones muted until the question and answer portion uh, uh, at the end of the talk. So this will be uploaded on the Norskidalisk Vittenskap YouTube channel at the end of February. We'll try to get it up uh, to you guys as soon as we can. Uh, so we're incredibly lucky today to have a chance to speak with such a pioneer and, you know, the boldness of your endeavors does not only, you know, help to build your, your ever expanding works, but also acts as a guide and inspiration to, to many of us who are also fellow consciousness explorers and we all have such a passion uh, for this and yeah, so Andrew is a chemical pharmacologist, a neurobiologist, and a writer uh, working as a postdoctoral researcher at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. And he's authored Alien Information Theory, Psychedelic Drug Technologies in the Cosmic Game, and has now recently come out with his new book, Reality Switch Technologies, Psychedelics as Tools for the Discovery and Exploration of New Worlds. I have these books to probably hand out to some of my friends <laughs> as well. <laughs> uh, anyway, and so uh, his current interests focus on DMT and other psychedelic molecules as tools for gating access to otherwise inaccessible subjective worlds, uh, looking at their uh, neuroscientific underpinnings and their possible ontological and metaphysical implications. And we're very, very grateful that she would choose to spend uh, part of your Thursday evening with us and are excited to learn more about psychedelic drug technologies in the brain. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you very much, Anna, for the kind introduction. Um, yes, so um, f first of all, I, I was in Okinawa. I'm now in Tokyo, so I've successfully de-institutionalized myself. So I'm no longer uh, working in the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, but I'm fully independent now, which means I can say what the fuck I like and nobody can stop me, basically. Um, so, yeah, so it's quite late here. It's like nine o'clock in the evening. It's been a long day, so I will try to remain coherent, but do raise your hands or whatever if I, if I start to not make sense. Hopefully I will remain reasonably cogent. Um, so... Uh, I'll probably talk for about an hour, I think, um, but you know, I'll, I'll get through as much uh, of this as I can. Um, I think um, hopefully you have the tolerance for some what might be considered by many to be rather far out ideas. This is not going to be a kind of a standard academic um, presentation by any stretch of the imagination. So please do. Um, 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 entertain some rather far out ideas. Okay, anyway, uh, to it. So first of all, as Anna was saying, there we go. Huh? Why is that not working? There we go. Um, yes, I have a new book out, Reality Switch Technologies, Psychedelics as Tools for the Discovery and Exploration of New Worlds. So this is a deep dive into how psychedelics work in the brain. So if you're interested in the science behind psychedelics in a lot more detail than I will go into today, uh, then this is certainly uh, the book. When I look at the classic psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin and DMT, and also things like ketamine and salvia divinorum and the tropane alkaloids and things like that. So please buy that. <laughs> um, and also my first book, Alien Information Theory, this was a very a work of speculative metaphysics, thinking about the origins of reality and the relationship between DMT and our reality and that kind of thing. So if you're into something a bit more far out, then the first book uh, would be recommended. Um, also, please do follow me on Twitter, Alien Insect. I post regularly about psychedelics and other things. <laughs> um, and also I have a Substack, Alien Insect on Drugs, which uh, I post every week talking about you know, getting into the the science and the pharmacology of, of of psychedelics and other drugs so if you're interested in learning about them you don't have to be a specialist it's for the kind of the interested curious amateur um, then please do subscribe for free to my uh, Substack. Uh, and everything you, uh, that i write about and talk about is it's all together on my website buildingalienworlds.com so please do visit me there 
Okay, so we're here to talk about mainly about DMT today. It's the molecule that I've been fascinated by and um, confounded by, astonished by, choose your uh, choose your word, really. It is a, a, a truly remarkable molecule, a short-acting um, psychedelic that has a rapid but extremely intense onset. You are hurtled through this rapidly changing procession of highly complex geometric imagery uh, before you kind of burst through uh, what's called breaking through into this extremely bizarre what appears to be hyper-technological, hyper-dimensional alien reality, teeming with intelligent beings of various kinds uh, that will communicate with you. Um, and all of this happens with great lucidity. It's like, it's, it's very, very clear. You, you can, it's like someone who just switched the channel on your reality. It is a, it's a truly remarkable effect and it's not well understood. Um, despite what some other people might tell you, it's actually very difficult to explain, even from a, certainly from an, uh, an orthodox neuroscientific perspective. And I've been trying and thinking about it for the last two decades. Uh, it's very difficult to explain how DMT achieves this. So we're going to look at some explanations, really, for what DMT might be doing and how we might use it to, as I say, um, communicate with these intelligences uh, from wherever they might be. Um, Graham Hancock pith, uh, pithily described the DMT space as highly artificial, constructed, inorganic, and in essence, technological. So this is a very bizarre um, constructed space that seems to be built by the hand of a, an extremely intelligent um, uh, being or set of highly advanced intelligences. Um, so we look at some typical reports of DMT users. Um, they are, the word is machine-like. The whole thing bodes of high alien technology. Um, there were insect-like intelligences everywhere in a hyper-technological space. It was very intelligent. It wasn't at all humanoid. Um, I was in a very large waiting room observed by these uh, insect things and others like it. They have an agenda. It's like walking into a different neighborhood. You're not really sure what the culture is. There were these beings that seemed to inhabit this place, seemed to come off as vastly more intelligent and vastly more capable. And you see these kind of reports consistently, repeatedly, people going to these extremely bizarre, highly technological spaces filled with these incredibly intelligent beings. So what's going on here? So we have basically three broad interpretations that you can think about. There might be others. One is, Okay, it's a hallucination. Um, it's just your brain making it all up. That's actually not um, particularly satisfactory to me um, for many reasons, some of which I'll get to. Um, the other idea is that perhaps these, these are structures from deep within uh, uh, our unconscious, the, the deeper levels of the brain, what Jung called the collective unconscious. So they're kind of uh, bubbling up uh, in the presence of DMT and taking form. Uh, again, I don't, I, I don't find that particularly satisfactory either. Uh, and then the alternative, more, most far out by far, <laughs> explanation is that we're dealing with some kind of true, conscious, alien intelligence, some intelligence from somewhere else. Uh, and I will think, I'll talk today a little bit about why that might be the case and how we might even um, learn to uh, communicate with them. So first of all, it's all happening in this structure in the brain. Your, your brain is this world building machine. Uh, it constructs your model of reality. So under all circumstances, when you are uh, awake, whether you are dreaming, or even if you're at the peak of a, uh, a DMT trip, your brain is always constructing this model of reality. It's constructing your world from patterns of neural activity. So what changes when um, you smoke DMT is that model. It's the model that changes. Now, is that model 
um, the normal waking world model is kind of mapped to sensory information from the environment. It helps to constrain and modulate and inform the world that you experience so that you can navigate uh, and flourish and survive and reproduce in the environment. Uh, so the question really is, is the DMT world, is that model the brain is constructing under the influence of DMT, is that also being, is it somehow receiving information from some other place, allowing the brain to construct this alternate model um, of this other reality within which these beings uh, exist? Um, so the world you experience is always the model, whether or not it's mapped to some kind of external environment. So it's this outer layer of the brain we're particularly interested in, the cortex. Uh, this is the part of the brain that's responsible uh, for constructing your, your world model. Uh, and going deeper in, into the cortex, we have these neurons, large, vast networks of neurons that generate and share information. And it's the patterns of information uh, that form your world, this unified pattern of information that emerges from the multitude of interactions between these neurons. So just to make it clear again, your world is a model of the environment constructed by your brain, and it is informed by sensory information. Sensory information constrains this world model. The, your, your, your brain is not a video camera. It takes its samples, patterns of information from the environment and uses it to help inform its model. So, oh, that sound. So your world emerges much like a a flock of starlings we can see here uh, emerges from the interactions between um, the birds, the starlings, your world emerges from the interactions between all of the neurons uh, of your, your cortex and your world is always emerging like a river is flowing or like a whirlpool. The whirlpool is always emerging. As soon as the water stops, the whirlpool disappears. In the same way, your world is constantly flowing. It's constantly emerging in the same way that this flock of starlings is constantly emerging. Um, and uh, I'll skip that. So your the connections between the different parts of your brain, between the neurons, um, uh, are responsible for shaping the structure and dynamics of your world, the type of world that emerges. So we can we can break the cortex down into a number of levels of organization. We start at the base molecules, right? The proteins, the receptors, the carbohydrates, the lipids uh, that make up neurons. Um, um, so the, the neuron is itself this complex system that emerges from the interactions of all these molecules. The neurons then interact with each other. They communicate, they share information and form neural networks. So the behavior of these neural networks emerges from the interactions between these billions of neurons and then ultimately we have the entire cortex from which your world model then emerges at the top so your world model is constantly emerging um, from at, at the highest level of this organize, organizational hierarchy of complexity and what sensory information is doing is stimulating neurons via the sensory apparatus the, the retina, the, uh, the EO, you know, et cetera, um, stimulating certain neurons, which perturbs that system, which perturbs the world that is being built. So this is why your world is dynamic or that it's always changing in response to sensory information. Your world is always being, uh, is always emerging anew. So looking at this in a little bit more detail. So the, the cortex is made from are built from these networks of neurons that form these cylindrical structures called cortical columns. And it's the cortical, co the cortical column is basically the fundamental unit of, um, it's called functional segregation um, in, in, in the brain. So basically it means that, well, let's have a look at it. If we look at it from um, above, we can see these Cortical columns are all kind of lined up, stacked next, next to each other, kind of like a three-dimensional mosaic. 
and they have certain layers which are also important for their their function so overall if you if you were to look at your cortex from a bird's eye view you would see um, these all of these cortical columns and they can these cortical columns can they interact with each other through connections between the neurons that from which they are uh, built uh, and they can also they can be active and they can be inactive and so you get patterns of activation of these cortical columns uh, which represents the information that is your world believe it or not so your world at any point in time is a pattern of activation of these uh, cortical columns and it's constantly changing shifting from pattern to pattern and as I said, these cortical columns are connected uh, with very specific patterns of connectivity that evolve and change and develop as you grow and develop and learn. The, the connections change and thus the patterns of activity um, uh, of your cortex also changes. Your brain learns to construct, if you like, its model of the world. Um, so to make this a little bit more clear, we can imagine different cortical columns being um, responsible for different features of your visual world. So we have columns that are responsible for motion, columns responsible for color, for texture, for, for form, that kind of thing. So your overall experience of a world uh, is what this pattern of information feels like from your subjective perspective. So psychedelics. So we have serotonin, right? So serotonin is this very well-known neuromodulator, neurotransmitter in the brain. And the classic psychedelics are very similar uh, to serotonin. So we have um, psilocybin on the left here, which is um, uh, from magic mushrooms, which is also uh, a, a classic psychedelic. Uh, and we have, uh, oh, uh, we have LSD here as well, uh, which is, a little bit more complex structure, but also um, um, is related to serotonin. And this is found in the uh, in ergot and is, well, it's not found in ergot, but it's it's synthesized from a molecule, the very similar molecule that's found in ergot. Um, so, so what psychedelics are doing, and I'm not going to go into the details here, uh, is they're binding to a, they bind to a particular type of serotonin receptor uh, in certain neurons in the deep layers of these cortical columns uh, they stimulate these receptors and they and they 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 perturb this complex network of molecules inside a neuron and they change the way that that neuron uh, behaves uh, they make that neuron slightly more excitable they make it easier for that neuron to fire electrochemical signals action potentials and to share information so you get this kind of spread of information between cortical columns in the presence of a, uh, a psychedelic so psychedelics they're acting at the molecular level they're binding to receptors at this lowest level but they are causing an effect at the highest level so the psychedelics they activate receptors change the way that receptors behave uh, which then affects the way that neurons behave so it affects the way that neurons share information. So it affects the behavior, the emergent behavior of these neural networks. And then ultimately it affects the structure and dynamics of your world model. And with classic psychedelics, what tends to happen is your world model goes from being very stable and predictable uh, and familiar to being more fluid and dynamic and novel and unpredictable. Uh, so you have this altered world model. Um, so what's going on here? Um, again, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail here, but what we know is that in the, under the influence of psychedelics, your brain, uh, as I said, it can, it can move more easily between states. So remember those patterns of cortical column activation. They're normally very tightly controlled by connectivity between the columns, but, it, but these are kind of overridden you get a kind of democratization of cortical columns in the psychedelic state, and they share information much more freely. So the world model seems to kind of break down um, and the, the, your experience of the world becomes much more fluid and dynamic. Another way to look at this is to imagine that all of the possible patterns of activation of your, um, of your, of your cortex, all the possible patterns of activation of those cortical columns, if you plotted all of those different patterns of activation, all the different possible states on a plane, some would be more 
uh, favorable than others. The brain will be more likely to reach certain states than others. And the, the cortex has kind of sculpted its connectivity so that the, the states that represent the normal waking world that's, that's working as a functional model of the environment tend to be in these valleys and basins, they're low energy states that the, the brain kind of reaches those more easily. Whereas these hills, these high energy states, don't represent functional models of the environment. And so these are kind of uh, disfavored states that your cortex doesn't reach. And what psychedelics do is, is by allowing the brain to reach formerly kind of disfavored states, to allow the brain to kind of move more freely between states, you get a kind of a flattening of this uh, energy landscape. Uh, so rather than these high hills and deep basins and valleys, you get a much more democratic, flattened landscape, which means the brain can move more freely and wander through different states much more easily, which is why um, the psychedelic state with sort of LSD or psilocybin, for example, tends to be much more fluid, uh, much more dynamic. Um, another way to think of this is that uh, under normal circumstances, your world model is emerging, as I said, uh, at the highest level uh, of your cortex. Actually, these very high order networks, one of them is called the default mode network, which you might have heard of. And this is basically suppressing um, the flow of information from the environment, trying to reduce the amount of information the brain is, uh, is receiving and predict the information and, and basically try and filter out really as much sensory information as it can, uh, whilst also suppressing information that's flowing up from lower subcortical structures uh, where more mm, uh, unconscious patterns are, are stored, so to speak. So you might think about archetypes and complexes of Jungian psychology there. Uh, and in the psychedelic state, this world model is disrupted, uh, which allows more information to flow in from the environment, but also more information to start flowing up from these lower levels of the brain. So the, so the world model not only becomes more fluid and dynamic, but it also becomes much more sensitive to incoming information. And that's a key point more sensitive to incoming information uh, that modulates uh, this uh, world model. So, so in the normal state, to kind of summarize here, what's happening is you've got this kind of, the brain is in a kind of rigid state. It's kind of fixed. You have um, information coming from the environment represented by the little bonsai tree here. Um, and that is, it is helping to to constrain and to inform your experience of the world, uh, but it, it's done in a very controlled uh, manner. The brain is in, in a very kind of rigid state. It's certainly not open to or susceptible to being completely reorganized uh, by another source of sensory information. However, if there was another source of sensory information, once you get into the psychedelic state, the brain is in a much more flexible, what you might call a hot state, rather like heating a piece of glass and it becomes malleable and you can kind of move, you can shift its shape into any desired form. Uh, that is what's happening in the psychedelic state, which means that the brain is much more sensitive to sensory uh, information and potentially, and this is where things become very, very speculative, potentially more sensitive to information from some other place. Uh, elsewhere right um i'm going to get to it but um, we're talking about information uh, an alternate sensory information source for example um that would allow your brain to construct a model of this other environment right um such as the dmt worlds so we can say that to experience the world's experienced, uh, inhabited by these bizarre alien intelligences. Um, what needs to happen is information from their world, wherever that might be, whether it's deep inside uh, the lower levels of the brain in unconscious structures, or whether it's from some other place, um, that must be able to flow into the brain. Uh, and because the brain is in this hot state, this flexible state induced by psychedelics, it is able to modulate its activity, allowing the brain to construct a model of that reality. Um, 
So then the question is, is, is what's the source of this information? So the brain is more sensitive to information uh, in the psychedelic state, particularly in the DMT state. Um, where is this information coming from that's allowing the brain to construct this entirely novel reality, this bizarre hyperdimensional domain filled with uh, extremely intelligent beings? Where is that information coming from that's allowing the brain to construct that model? It's not coming from the normal environment. We know that. So where is it coming from? Um, because it, your brain cannot just, your brain is not a magician. It's it's a wonderful highly complex, beautiful, remarkable machine. Uh, but it's, I don't believe, in, you know, in my opinion, your brain is capable of simply fabricating uh, worlds without certainly the extremely complex and crystalline, clear worlds, uh, bizarre worlds, hyperdimensional worlds filled with intelligent beings. I don't believe that your, your brain is capable of doing that without some kind of en uh, information source, some kind of alternate sensory information source. So we have a, kind of three options here. Um, one is it's internal information. Um, so it's coming from lower levels, if you like, of, of the uh, of, uh, subcortical structures. Um, um, so we could be talking about autonomous psychic complexes from Carl Jung or archetypal patterns that are being unfolded. Um, but to me, that doesn't, it's not particularly satisfying because the, the worlds you experience in DMT, they don't, they, they have a kind of an archetypal flavor sometimes, uh, but the, the intelligences seem to be much more powerful. They have much more intent. Um, it doesn't seem to be a kind of a dreamlike experience, for example. It seems to be much more complex and rich um, and, um, and intelligent um, than, than something that would emerge uh, simply from lower level old uh, primordial archetypal structures which tend to be much simpler than that the alternative is external information this is what most people would discount out of hand and say that's not possible um, that this is some other intelligence some higher level intelligence that exists somewhere else outside of the brain so the information is not coming from elsewhere in the brain, but actually from some other place. Uh, in truth, I actually think it's probably both of the thing, these things. I think there is, um, the, the brain has to form a model of this reality, even if there is some external reality filled with um, alien intelligences, your brain still has to build a model of it. So I think it uses information from that reality, but also it is using its archetypal toolbox, if you like, to make, to form models that make sense. Um, uh, things that you can recognize as living beings, for example. So, this, so the whole thing kind of gets a little bit mixed up. You get a mixture of archetypal structures and then extremely novel um, structures. Um, so the idea of information flowing into the brain and your brain using it to build a model is familiar to all of us. So um, virtual reality relies upon delivering via the eyes a pattern of a novel pattern of sensory information into the brain and making it feel like to you that you're in a different place you don't have to go somewhere right i can have a meeting with a group of these people right uh in this this room i don't need to go there all that ha all that's required is that we all wear this vr headset and we all rec receive the sensory information which allows us to experience this place you know if you bought a new apartment you could show me around it i would put the vr headset on and you would walk around with a camera uh, and as long as it's properly set up uh, you could show me all around um and it would be like i was there um so you don't have to travel this is kind of a common misconception is that i'm saying that you have to travel to an alien reality no 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 all that has to happen is the information must be gated into the brain somehow in the presence of dmt that allows your brain to construct a model of that reality so another way kind of a pithy way of putting it when you break through on dmt you are not breaking through into the dmt world the dmt world is breaking through into you it is taking control of your brain's world building machinery and creating its world using your brain. Um, 
kind of feels like this if you've never taken DMT. <clears throat> so it takes control. It's, it's sudden, uh, it's cataclysmic, and it is complete. Your world model is switched in an instant. You are no longer, your brain is no longer constructing the normal waking world, but is constructing this bizarre hyper-dimensional alien reality filled with these uh, intelligences. Okay, so why might I think that this is possible? Why might I entertain the idea for a moment that um, we might be dealing with some kind of um, discarnate alien intelligence? And Terence McKenna put it better than ever uh, I ever could. Uh, to search expectantly for a radio signal from an extraterrestrial source is probably as culture-bound a presumption as to search the galaxy for a good Italian restaurant. In other words, uh, we rely upon um, you know, sending out pulses of electromagnetic radiation, looking for uh, detecting patterns of radiation from different star systems in the hope that they might show signs of intelligence. This is... Uh, kind of ridiculous, uh, really, to think that this is ever going to be successful in finding a, an advanced intelligence. The fact, the likelihood that they're using radio waves, if they're a million years more advanced than us, is kind of absurd. Um, and, and to make matters worse, as, as Paul Davis, the famous uh, physicist who wrote many wonderful books, uh, said this, I think it very likely, in fact, inevitable, that biological intelligence is only a transitory phenomenon if we ever encounter extraterrestrial intelligence, I believe it is very likely to be post-biological in nature. In other words, we're not going to be dealing with flesh and blood beings that fly around uh, in physical, shimmering, metallic disks. We are going to be dealing with something that is uh, perhaps in inconceivably different, that would be completely transparent to normal modes of, of communication, way beyond anything we could conceive of. Um, uh, Susan Schneider, uh, who's an astrobiologist, uh, says this, once a society creates the technology that could put them in touch with the cosmos, they are only a few hundred years away from changing their own paradigm from biology to artificial intelligence. Um, so that means really that if we look at the progression of an intelligent civilization, um, we find ourselves in this very, very thin sliver. Um, anything before us, anything before our technological age, uh, we might call pre-technological. We can't communicate with those, right? Because they have no means of communicating. Um, so we can forget about those. Those in our condition, in our kind of phase, this technological phase where we are now, where we're still flesh and blood beings that kind of have, you know, galactic ambitions, but aren't actually that smart. Um, this is what most people are focusing on, this thin sliver of intelligence that's in this technological phase before, as Susan Schneider said, it uh, casts casts away the biological form becomes a post biological form, so the vast um, um, majority of intelligent life in this universe, at least, is most likely to be post biological, uh, which is kind of a startling thought, really. So we're spending all of our time trying to find these these beings that exist within this very thin sliver. We don't realize there's probably a vast amount of intelligence in this universe, in others, uh, that is that is so far advanced. You know, we're not just talking beings that can you know build jet, you know, special space propulsion mechanism. We're talking about beings that are so strange, so advanced, that we have no way of even thinking about what they might be like. Um, so let's think about the types of civilization. Let's break it down a little bit. So we have the Kardashev scale, which is kind of famous, uh, which uh, it has a number of um, instantiations. Uh, but basically, we, we start at type one or perhaps type zero, which is where we are. Um, and we, we kind of expand outward. We start taking over. A civilization starts taking over more and more of the cosmos. First, it starts to control the energy of its entire planet. Then it expands and it's able to control the energy of its host star. Um, 
then it's able to control the energy of, of its entire galaxy and we go on and on um so it's ultimately when we get to sort of five and six um uh, it's able to actually control the energy um over perhaps the entire multiverse right and so not just our universe but the entire system of whatever this universe is part of whatever that larger structure that we know nothing about um these are the type of intelligences that are kind of expanding outward and outward and outward and then ultimately you have, might have a type six civilization uh, which actually finds a way to escape space time uh, entirely uh, and exist in some other place that we have no idea about these are the ones that i'm particularly interested in um another way of looking at the development of an alien uh, an intelligent civilization is to first notice that actually as humans develop as our civilization technology develops we don't really spend most of our time trying to move outwards you know we're not constantly thinking about how can we take control of the energy uh, of the whole earth or of the sun actually what we're doing is thinking about how can we take control of things smaller and smaller and smaller. So you have things like nanotechnology, where we can manipulate individual atoms, or going even further, we can manipulate the structure of electrons. So actually, intelligent civilizations tend to look inwards at smaller and smaller scales, rather than necessarily looking outwards. So this is kind of an, uh, an alternative to the, the Kardashev scale. Uh, and we start here with uh, type one minus it's going the opposite direction so uh, a type one minus civilization uh, um, would be capable of manipulating you know building structures objects about their own size uh, and we go smaller and smaller and smaller so we kind of sit between type three minus and type four minus so a type three minus civilization can manipulate molecules molecular bonds create new chem materials so we're talking about chemistry here uh, and then a type four minus can manipulate individual atoms we're talking about nanotechnologies the um we're kind of getting there now we're kind of close to a type four minus um civilization uh, and then we can go even further um type five minus capable of manipulating the atomic nucleus and engineering the fundamental particles uh, within it or so-called fundamental particles uh, and then type six minus where you can manipulate not just discover or detect but actually manipulate the most elementary particles and then we have the ultimate the type omega minus so an, an omega minus civilization is understands fully the deepest the, the 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 structure of base reality and is able to manipulate the structure of space time and perhaps even deeper space time itself might be emergent um so this is the ultimate level if you like uh, a type uh, uh, omega minus civilization um so we sit here basically um whereas the type omega minus this would be unfathomable unfathomable to us inconceivable what this intelligence might be able to achieve uh, it might even be able to achieve if we if we think again about the idea of a post-biological civilization a post-biological civilization might be able to actually instantiate itself within the deepest computational structure of base reality itself um so when people think about an artificial intelligence a post-biological civilization uh, we're not talking about you know big servers stacked up on a on the nearest moon kind of running a civilization uh, we're talking about a uh, civilization that is actually able to instantiate itself digitally uh, computationally whatever techniques they use at the base level level of reality uh, again they would be completely undetectable uh, to us we would have no idea of their existence so so there are broad two broad bearing all that in mind two kind of broad approaches to, to alien communication um the, the standard approach number one here is is, is to think about intelligences within our universe, within our space time. So electromagnetic pulses, that kind of stuff. Um, alternatively, um, what I think is more interesting is to think about the possibility of alien intelligences that exist either outside our space time, 
So these type five and six on the Kardashev scale that have eight been able to actually um, take control of at multiverse levels or even exit space time entirely into some other place um, or beings that are these type omega minor civilizations. Uh, and these might not be mutually exclusive, by the way, uh, that have deep, that have being able to kind of embed themselves or instantiate themselves at the base of reality. Uh, communicating with these, I think, is, is certainly likely to rely on the technology of the alien. They would have to instantiate, they would have to initiate the communication. Uh, we will have no ability to even start there. Um, but I actually think that communication with two is actually more likely um, because it doesn't rely on traversing vast distances doesn't rely on waiting several millennia for a reply to a little electromagnetic pulse but actually um, there might be a means of communication directly from that uh, intelligence so i think um that if an, an, an alien intelligence either from outside or deeply embedded within this universe so these type five and six or these omega minus intelligences if they want to communicate with us i think the brain would be the most likely means of communication the most direct means of communication because what could happen is they could gate the flow of information into our brain as this alternate source of sensory information which would allow our brain then to basically construct a model of, of that you know, their reality some kind of model i'm not saying it would be a true accurate model but it would be some kind of model that might allow us to, to establish two-way communication with that intelligence um okay still have some time um so so ed fredkin who was a physicist at uh, and a computer scientist at carnegie mellon um one of the founders of so-called digital physics said that uh, words to the effect at that we 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 can't know anything about the laws of physics what is and isn't possible uh, in some other place anything any universe or other reality outside of our universe we can't say anything about it we can't say what is or isn't possible we can't say anything about the physics uh, we can't say anything about time we can't say anything about its spatial or otherwise structure we can say nothing about it we call this place other so we can think of these um uh, hypothetically think of these alien intelligences as occupying a place like that a place that we have we know nothing about um so the normal way that we kind of extrapolate our universe the one that theoretical physicists are keen on is to take our universe universe zero we'll call it and say okay what if there are others we'll call it universe one universe two parallel universes then you can start to Think about what are the rules for how information can flow between those universes? How can those universes interact? You can start to think about those kind of things. You can build a theory, right? And that might work if these universes uh, at least have some reasonable relationship that could be understood between our universe uh, and these other universes. So you can have these rules represented by R, which dictate how the universes interact. What you can't do um, is develop any kind of rules uh, for how uh, this other place, this place that Ed Fredkin called other, interacts with our universe. We can say nothing about it. We might devise a rule for how our universe, based on the laws of physics that reign in our universe, uh, how they interact with other. But again, that even that would be extremely tenuous. So we have this asymmetry here where we can say nothing about the way that other in, interacts with our universe or the way information or energy flows from other into our universe. Uh, um, I'll skip this. So this is what I call the, the principle of unknowable asymmetry, which basically says that any asymmetric rules governing the interactions between other and our universe cannot be known a priori. We cannot say anything about it. We cannot say anything about the rules, what can and cannot happen. Uh, this is a really important point because, uh, as I said before, if you want to experience, you want to communicate with other, with this other place within which these intelligences reside, you don't have to have a flow of information from our universe to the other place, right? You don't have to go anywhere. No one is traveling anywhere here. All that needs to happen, as I said, is that there would be some gating of the flow of information from 
this other place into your brain. This would be the mode of uh, communication, the mode of gating that flow of alternate sensory information. This we cannot rule out according to the principle of unknowable uh, asymmetry. Uh, perhaps I will go back to this briefly. Um, so, so imagine you are a, uh, to imagine kind of our position here, imagine that you are a, a character in this, in a computer game, let's say. If everyone remember, this is one of my favorite computer games back in the, the late 80s, uh, Prince of Persia, a wonderful game. Um, and imagine you are the prince here, um, and you are trying to, you're very smart, you're trying to develop a model of your, the physics of your reality, yes? Um, you might be, even have discovered the fundamental building block of your reality, which you call the pixel, yes? And you might build beautiful models of how this uh, reality works, yes? Uh, but of course, to us, it would all be completely ridiculous and nonsense because to us standing outside, we know that we can just manipulate the reality by altering the code. This is the source code for this particular game, Prince of Persia. We, very simple for us to go in there. We can manipulate the, the code. We can change how the physics behaves. To us, it's very simple. So we have this asymmetry. We can influence his world, the Prince of Persia's world, very, very easily because we built it. Uh, but he could have no idea. He could not comprehend or even conceive what's going on in other, which is our world, right? So we're in that position, possibly, right? We are the Prince of Persia in this game. We think we know it all, but actually we have no idea uh, what's actually going on. Okay, so... So I think we can start to take seriously, this is the last part of the, uh, the talk, uh, I think we can start to take seriously the idea that actually when you are confronted with an alien intelligence or somebody, a being that claims to be advanced alien intelligence from some other place, you have to be very, very careful because he could be just who he, say he says he is. So for that reason, I think we should develop DMT as a technology for at least exploring this space, ex trying to establish communication uh, with these beings. And for that purpose, uh, I uh, developed with uh, Rick Strassman this idea of um, using a technology from um, anesthesiology called target controlled intravenous infusion. Uh, so we published a paper uh, back in 2016 um, in which we proposed that you could extend the DMT experience. So here we go. Uh, you could extend the DM DMT experience from just a few minutes. Normally, it only lasts for five minutes. You're in the space and you're dragged back out. So what if you could extend that experience to 30 minutes or an hour or several days, right? Um, this is actually possible with this technology. Uh, and what it relies on is um, using a mathematical model, a pharmacokinetic model, to maintain a stable brain DMT concentration over time. So you deliver the DMT into the blood vessels using a, a programmed infusion device um, informed by this model, uh, and that allows you to maintain this stable DMT brain concentration over time. So you can induce someone into the DMT state and actually hold them there, uh, not for five, 10 minutes, but for as long as you want, allowing them to explore the space, to navigate the space, to map the space, uh, and to establish two-way communication with these beings and find out where the hell they're from <laughs> um, uh, and what they want from us. Um, so, so this extended state DMT trip, which is called DMTX, kind of looks like this. So you have your brain concentration called the effect site here, this smooth line, uh, and it goes up initially. Uh, this is the initial kind of entry phase, that very chaotic stage where the DMT levels are rising in the brain. Uh, then it starts to flatten out if the infusion is properly controlled and programmed. Um, and the, the individual then starts to orient themselves into, into the space. The brain uh, gets used to building the model of this alternate reality. Uh, and then you, you're in the stabilization phase where you can remain and, and navigate and interact with the beings in there for as long as you want. Um, this technology has actually just been deployed by Imperial College London. And we've just finished the first um, the first study with 30 minute infusions and the, uh, the paper will be published, I think later this year. So that's one to look out for. So in the future, I imagine um, that we could 
have these kind of pods, if you like, the kind of sci-fi, it's a kind of a science fiction idea, I think. But ultimately, where you would you would enter one of these pods, you would uh, enter a journey time, uh, and then based upon your own physiological, your body, your body weight, your age, your sex, et cetera, uh, the, the, the system would calculate the correct infusion uh, and, and you could remain, you could go into, enter the DMT space for uh, as long as you uh, want. Uh, and indeed, you can even think about, you know, feeding um, somebody, uh, get, getting rid of wastes, that kind of thing, if they wanted to remain within the space for days or weeks um, for extended sojourns, extended experiments. Okay, uh, so finally, final point. So this is a molecular technology. Yes, DMT is a molecular technology. You have to you have to inject DMT into someone's bloodstream and, and keep it there. So that in itself is not um, ideal. Uh, now, what DMT is actually doing, as I said, is it's it's binding to these receptors um, on the site uh, on the surface of, of neurons uh, and activating them. Now. Um, um, yeah, so these receptors are found in these deep layers, these deep uh, pyramidal cells of the cortical columns. Um, so as I said before, just going back to this, the, the DMT binds to this 5-HT2A serotonin receptor and, and perturbs this complex network of molecules inside the neuron, which leads to the psychedelic effect. Um, so what's actually going on here is that DMT, when it binds to the receptor, is causing the receptor to kind of distort and change shape. And it's that change in its shape, its conformation, um, that, that uh, allows the receptor to interact with these intracellular, these molecules inside the cell, the signaling molecules, which causes the, the change in the behavior of the neuron and ultimately the change in the structure of the world. So um, so here we can see it clearly, 5-HT2A um, receptor binds to DMT and you get a change in the receptor shape, which causes the signaling. So what if we could induce the, this change in the, the receptor conformation without adding a drug? What if we could cause the receptor to activate without having to put a, uh, a drug in someone's body? And there's actually a technique for doing this using magnets. So these are called magnetoreceptors. Uh, and the basic principle, there are several different types, is that you have a you have your receptor. In this case, it says ion channel, but it works the same with, with normal kind of receptors. Um, you have your receptor that's bound to these super paramagnetic beads. Um, and when the, the in, in the absence of a magnetic field, uh, these beads don't kind of stick to each other and the receptors are inactive. As soon as you add a magnetic field, they cluster together, they pull on the receptor, they distort the receptor and actually activate it. Um, so you can use magnets, in other words, as long as you, if you can put these receptors into someone's brain, and they've done it with animals already, um, you can then use um, magnets simply. You can put a mag magnet over the head um, and, and activate, switch on these receptors, switch on the psychedelic effect uh, without having to actually uh, in, uh, give someone any kind of exogenous molecule. You don't need to inject them with, with any kind of drug. So the way that this works basically is to, is to take the, the magnetoreceptor gene, insert it into a uh, a, a virus, and then um, using special techniques, selectively express um, the, the receptor in certain neurons. So these magnetoreceptors that are sensitive to the magnetic field, you can selectively express them based upon the selectivity of the of the virus. The virus will only infect and inject the the DNA containing the, the gene into certain types of neurons. Uh, and this has already been done, uh, not with psychedelic. Uh, not with the 5-HT2A receptor, uh, but with um, with other receptors. So you can switch on, you can change the behavior of an animal uh, by inserting these magnetically controlled receptors. Very, very cool. Uh, so in the future, you might imagine rather than laying down and being injected with a, a drug, you would put on some sort of electromagnetic cap. You would switch on the 
um, the electromagnetic field and they will be in instantaneously transported for as long as, they, as, as the magnetic field remained on into that, um, into that space. He would switch them on into the DMT space, which I think is a really uh, cool idea. And then we can go even further. This is the final slide. And think about the, the deep future, right? Could we send, could we semi-permanently place someone into the DMT space? Um, uh, and you can imagine the kind of setup that we would have uh, where we would in induce somebody into a kind of uh, a hypometabolic state, the same kind of thing they use on or they propose to use on space journeys. You put someone in a low metabolic state, kind of a hibernation state when the brain is still active. Um, you can stimulate their muscles over time so they don't waste. You can supply nutrition through an infusion you can even now in supply oxygen without needing a mask or anything uh, using um uh, a, a, an intravenous gas exchange catheter and use what's called microfluidic oxygen uh, you can collect uh, urine and fecal wastes of course very important uh, and also you might use some kind of immersion technology so they could fully lose uh, awareness of their body um, so that would be the bodily support if you like uh, over extended periods and then of course you would have the the magnetic system um which would switch them into the reality okay so i think that's as far as i need to go so um yeah um i will thank you for your kind attention uh, and happy to take any questions <laughs> wow um <laughs> i think that was probably my muted favorite you're muted anna tech. oh do you hear me now I could hear you all along. I don't know. Can mm -hmm. you hear me, Andrew? Um, I, he might have muted everybody else, though. I don't know. Can't hear you. Can you hear Anna? Um, do you hear me now? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I had my computer on mute. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, I just was uh, very. I, I feel like it was just five minutes, so we entered into a, a, a hyperspace with you because honestly, I'm like. Is that all? That was the fastest five minutes of my life. <laughs> but to be honest, I mean, uh, I for me, I've been interested in these questions for fifteen years now, so uh, it's not uh, it's not out there for me. But I mean, I'm sure a couple more are probably <laughs> freaked out, <laughs> interested in that, and maybe some are freaked out. But you know, I think what you've described is almost the. Um, yeah, it's almost like the transition to a different age already, just by the use, the possible use that we're going to start where we're starting now. And so in a way, it's like you are really eschewing in a new type of civilization for us. So I don't know, I see it that way. So I mm. think it's amazingly cool. I have a couple questions, but I'll, I'll wait, sure. to close them a little bit later. I'll start um, maybe getting other people's questions first. I see Erlen. So we also have Oslo representation here. Hi, Erlen. So he asks, how can one get involved in this research? Loved your podcast with Duncan. <laughs> Duncan Trustle, that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Um, so as I said, I mean, I, I work entirely independently. I, 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 I do a little bit of consulting uh, for people. Um, the There are basically two major DMTX so this is the extended state dmt groups um in the world major ones one at imperial college as i said we've just finished um how can you get involved with them i don't know they might put a call out at some point during the next study they've just finished the first one um then you have the dmtx.org uh, out of boulder colorado uh, again um, if you go to their website dmtx.org you can get information there. I don't know um, whether they're recruiting yet. They're still kind of at the, uh, still kind of the bureaucratic stuff and the legal stuff to kind of get this off the ground. It's kind of difficult because they're not an, an academic organization. Um, so um, yeah, that's all I can suggest. Certainly, please don't write to me and ask me if you can, you know, <laughs> I can recruit you because I'm not, I'm not doing human studies here in Japan. Okay, so I have some questions from Ingve that he prepared before the talk. 
Do you have any expectations or thoughts about the results that might come out of the DMT infusion experiments? Um, well, we already know. Um, again, I don't have, can't discuss the full results because I don't really know them. Um, I wasn't directly involved in the study at Imperial. We already know that, uh, as I predicted and hoped, that an individual can be brought into the state and actually that the intensity, the level of the state, the experience would, does actually stabilize. Um, so it's not like the initial phase where you're kind of tumbling around and you know hurtling through these uh, strange places and having, you know, you, you're actually able to kind of get your intellective tools in order uh, and to orient yourself in the space and navigate the space. So that's the key thing is that it works. It does what you expect. I don't think there was time for them to or any aim to kind of establish two-way communication with the intelligences but that would be what ultimately would come out of this is first of all mapping the structure of the space um are there levels to the space the way that we can navigate to move through the space can that be formalized in some way so it's not kind of random where you end up and where you go um and also looking at the varieties the types of entities are there certain types of entities that we can access at will and if so what do we then do do we are there kinds of information we'd like to receive from these entities so you would you know i i always imagine that the dmtx team would involve mathematicians and linguists and anthropologists and artists and physicians nearest a whole team of different people uh, all bringing their different expertise to it to think about what kind of experiments now that we have stable access to this long-term sustained access to this space what kind of experiments uh, can we do can we think about the, the ontology of the space can we answer the question of whether they are real or not uh, and if so you know where are they from what is their intent where did they come from you can just imagine once you have you know, you, you, you have an interview with an alien, um, you know, what are your questions going to be? <laughs> but uh, it also must take a special kind of person, though, to be uh, induced in such a state, because a lot of people have struggled with loss of control, like very heavily. And so the first thing I thought when I started to hear about these um, extended sessions was, but what's going to happen to the person once they're back? Are they post-human now? Because how can that person be brought back into our reality and feel meaningfully human again because i mean it's already hard for people like us who are interested in these ideas and these questions and spend our lives having fun and you know doing our best to experience very strange things but i would think that an extended session like that where time is not the same because it's 30 minutes here but but how do we know how long it is really in the other? It's almost as if the person's now going to experience another lifetime or maybe many and several. Maybe they even get yes. to build their own reality somewhere else, come back here. Oh, like Inception. Right. And then they feel. Right, that right. Lucky. Yes. I mean, these are unanswered questions, right? Yeah. And, and I always say we could be in one of these machines now and, and, and we're, yeah. any minute we're going to pop, pop out back into the alien true world if you like and they'll say what was that like and you'll go you no fucking idea man i was this weird creature that walked around this 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 <laughs> this this blue ball going around a star it was wild um so i don't know um i think certainly people need to be trained right this is this is not this is a it's like a deep try like training an astronaut or a deep sea diver or something you don't just throw anyone down there and say good luck uh these people have to be trained they have to learn to navigate learn to deal with it um learn to perhaps even deliver information transmit information in real time from the space into the, the team waiting on the other side um lots of you know there's a I think a whole technology surrounding it beyond just delivering the DMT into the brain. There's a whole set of apparatus and technologies that need to be developed supporting all of that. And that will include the training program uh, for the individuals. And that's what DMTX in Boulder are trying to do is actually train people to, uh, to handle being in the space for an hour, for two hours for several days i mean um it's yeah it's um it's pretty wild to think about 
Yeah, because um, I've heard now just an anecdotal thing about people being in these sessions, being able to talk to each other, like two people are induced and then they're talking to each other in the DMT space. Have you, do you have anything to say about that? Well, I mean, I've heard that anecdotally of people saying that either at the same time, um, so they both go in together they don't necessarily speak to each other whilst in the space, but when they come out, they both describe seeing the same people or one describes seeing their partner interacting with entities. Uh, so kind of uncanny things like that. Of course it is, you know, anecdotes. So that kind of thing. I mean, if that could be um, properly established and tested and, and proved that actually this can happen, that would be one way you could think about the ontology of the space. That would, Go, go some way to showing that they are actually accessing some um, autonomous reality. They're not simply, you know, hallucinating. Um, but so, yeah, that would be another experiment that I'm sure many people are itching to do. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I probably will do some of these. <laughs> That's my goal. Sure, you can do many of these experiments you can do That's with your friends. That's the exciting <laughs> part that we have honestly so many things. And I didn't even know anything about magnetoreceptors. <laughs> which to me, I mean, there's a lot of things that blew my mind. So I have a lot of things to look into, but I'm curious because I know you mentioned even on your Twitter about uh, that, you know, a lot of the mystic from the mystic perspective, they're like, you're not mystic enough. And, yeah. and, and I, so I won't, I won't go too into mystical. I'll just sort of, you know, graze it a little, but I'm curious about light because we, so you have here that, yeah, we can, use drugs to enter we can potentially use these magnetoreceptors but what about light is there a way that we can stimulate light or stimulate uh our energy field uh, and that that sort of relates and you know the brain almost comes in secondary to just try to put all of the input in some order um i i don't rule it out i mean i'm a neuroscientist so when people start talking about energy fields i I tend to wince a little bit, um, but um, certainly, yes, I mean, like there are technologies already for inducing some kind of altered state of consciousness using these flashing lights, very bright lights. I think the system's called Lumia or something. Um, um, it's not quite, it's not really the same as a psychedelic trip, but you have to think of how can we manipulate, how can we perturb this world building machinery in the head um, such that it becomes receptive, such that it, it reaches this hot, this malleable hot state, fluid state, where it can start to receive information uh, and actually start to reorganize. Um, psychedelic drugs are by far the most efficient way of doing that that we know of. Um, magnetoreceptors, light, sound, um, other techniques that are yet to be discovered. Who knows? I'm, I'm open to all ideas um, as long as they work. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the thing, right? Is um, there's a big difference between scientists and researchers. And I think you need to be able to open your mind to ask questions. So I, I really understand the sentiment of being happy now to be working outside of the university space because it's incredibly constraining. And the thing is, even before I logged on, of course, I, I don't know, I got into Twitter the last couple of months, <laughs> but some, I think one of the DMN, um, yeah, it's just this tweeting profile mm. called that. So about the default mode network. So it's everything yeah, yeah. That, uh, he writes about is that, um, you know, it put a quote about how we are just uh kind of you know before we have the greeks and you know we almost feel like we're even before that time in terms of our how far we've been able to go and and the issue is a lot of the times the hive mind is so strong and it doesn't want to accept or open up to new ideas but the thing is there's no choice but to do that in order for us to move forward so that's also kind of why we host these talks too and i'm glad that it'll be on youtube so there'll be a lot of people who get to um gander all of the cool stuff that you brought up today are there other people because i think a lot of people maybe are a little intimidated <laughs> <That's> <laughs> don't be because i expected oh there'll be a like a huge wave but i think people are like i don't know what to say this is so cool so ingva had another <laughs> question that he asked um let's see here uh 
which one do you want to ask Ingve? Because you have three here. You have about AI. You also have about, uh, do you think humans will be able to con uh, get complete control of the world space in the future, being able to journey to any part of it at will using technology? Um, uh, I think so. If we pursue that, then I don't see why not. I think the danger is that we destroy ourselves before we reach that that stage. Um, if if we manage to survive, then I think it's probably inevitable. Somebody will. Somebody will pick up the mantle long after I'm gone, or maybe not. You know, maybe before. I mean, these things tend to be exponential. I mean, we've seen what you know things like chat gpt and stuff you know these things can they can emerge very very quickly and become very very powerful um so these kind of technologies i mean we we might even think of using artificial intelligence to actually design the protocol so design these receptor stimulation or these magnetoreceptor protocols that will generate the type of neuroactivity that would allow you to explore these different worlds um these different realities and referred to the world space there that's from my book you must have read my book um uh, but yeah so I, I think the dmt world is actually one of an, a vast number of possible worlds that a human brain can experience and uh, so it, it's kind of it's not just the dmt world so to speak we're, we're dealing here we could be dealing with a an almost infinite array of worlds that the human brain could could model and, and thus visit and so exploring all of that you know it's endless landscapes of the mind you know worlds without end so um i can imagine that we will get there eventually but i, I can't promise it will be soon and uh, the other one was, how do you think AI connects to the world space? Do you think it's possible to build an AI that can access these realities? Um, that's, again, you know, um, I think it's it's possible. I mean, the AI itself, of course, uh, uh, what I could see happening is 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 an AI that was in, was in interfacing with our brain. I mean, whether an AI could reach these worlds, um, we wouldn't know. and We can't get into it. We would never know whether it was kind of conscious. Uh, but I can think of using artificial intelligence to interface with our brain. So the, the AI would, would learn, would, would develop and learn how to manipulate our brain activities. So it would be plugged in in some way to us, interfaced in our brain, uh, and then it would manipulate um, much like DMT does, but in a different manner, in a highly precisely controlled manner, such that we can, uh, we can say, you know, take me to this location in the vast number of worlds in the world space and it would instantly it would find that location and find that particular pattern of neural stimulation that would take you there that's you know just thinking off the top of my head um the kind of thing that that we could achieve i think yeah i mean a lot of these uh questions are really super theoretical so Oh yeah, yeah. At least it's fun to be able to pose them. Um, yeah. yeah, sometimes I wonder if we're already the perfected AI. <laughs> of course, I've had a lot of personal experiences that, um, yeah, that was like one of the questions I wanted to ask was, you know, I know it's, it is difficult, especially when we're trying to move forward and we're trying to move forward as a society, but we also have a lot of people and, and pockets of people who have had extraordinary experiences. And these are with with drugs and not also without drugs and who have felt and seen and experienced different entities different uh, divine experiences all sorts of experiences that yeah are numinous and they transcend language and you know i think it's uh, interesting to also be able to um give a little bit more of a voice to these people of course like you said we should have a team of anthropologists and psychologists and you know molecular biologists and so on to be able to um, move through this space I think together but there are so many accounts through thousands of years of you know and connecting too to these strange beings and and beings that even call themselves architects of creation you know I the, the T omega made me think of that like oh the architects who created this world and the others and yeah. and, like, and so um what do you think of, uh, like, how how do you think we can move forward in this field um, in terms of, like, how can we meaningfully investigate the experiences, the experiences of others 
um, should we should we um, pay attention? Um, I don't know. What do what do you what do you think? Do you do you do you feel like when you hear some people's accounts that you just kind of I don't know throw it by the wayside or like how how do you think we can yeah move forward together as you know because we we really are few across the world who want to do this and you know yeah I, I think I, I mean yeah I mean the so obviously experiences can take you so far I mean you know everyone has access to this experience um if you can find dmt or extract dmt it's very easy to do it's very easy to use with vape pens these days you can dissolve extract dmt dissolve it in any liquid and have a vape pen and you can uh, with great control and efficiency you can take yourself into this space so everyone has access to it that's the beautiful thing about dmt is it's democratic this is not a technology that only the elite know about or can use right or people in, in uh, academic institutions with millions of dollars right anybody can access the space so first of all that's the first most important thing then of course we do have people who are uh, trained to to explore it more thoroughly so it's like you know everyone can kind of wander around the countryside but we need people to uh, to, to to create the, the the maps right we need people to to build the roads we need people to look at the elevation and, and and that kind of thing all of that stuff needs special training and special technologies yes but anybody can go outside and, and wander through the forests and explore the beautiful world that we live in and it's kind of like that um anyone can go into the dmt space but i think we do need these certain people who are willing to go there for much longer to do experiments experiments in there, as I say, uh, and to uh, develop the tools so that other people then can say, OK, this is how you, you know, this is how you navigate the DMT space. This is these are the entities you meet. This this is how you access certain intelligences and, and, and how you communicate with them. This is the language they speak. Right. So so I think it's it's collaborative universally as a, as a human civilization, the discovery of an intelligence or set of intelligences beyond this universe, no doubt would be the most profound discovery in the history of humankind, like by many orders of magnitude. Um, so it, it, this is something that belongs to humanity, I think. Uh, and and what's I think beautiful about DMT is the fact that it's ubiquitous in nature. It's everywhere you look. So it's almost like we're putting the technology, and this intelligence has said, we're placing this technology everywhere. So not just certain people have to carefully construct it in a laboratory. It's not this secret molecule. It's everywhere. Uh, and so anybody can access it. And I think there's, there's something wonderful about that idea that it belongs to, uh, to humanity. Um, so so yeah, ultimately, I think we will have more of these tools and technologies developed by people in the research institutions and these brave journeyers that go into the space for weeks at a time, uh, and then ultimately this will all be codified, and you will be able, you will have a manual that you know a guide to uh, the lonely planet, the lonely multiverse guide to <laughs> <laughs> the DMT world, something That's like that. So beautifully said. I see that there's a question. <laughs> Question in the chat by uh, Morten. He asks, "Are you familiar with the Expanse book series?" This is a sci-fi boy. Um, I, 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 really I, I, <laughs> fascinating take on how post-biological civilization has taken transit into existing uh, as information carrying mm -hmm. systems and perils that a fledgling civilization like humans face when exposed to the tech remnants of a civilization that had billions of years to evolve. Right. So, I mean, yeah, I, I've not seen it, but, you know, these ideas, uh, I think, have, have been propagated in, in science fiction for decades. Similar kind of, certainly in terms of, you know, what does a post-biological, post-human civilization look like? And uh, I don't think we've really had any idea of what it might look like. And I think what's amazing about DMT is we might be able to actually confront. We don't have to wait for messages um arriving from distant star systems we actually are able to confront face to face the face of this um post-biological -bio advanced intelligence 
Yeah, I mean, I think the most one of or at least one of the most important takeaways for today's talk is to continue to get the idea out there that we don't need to use any sort of sophisticated radio signals to go out and, you know, emit and try to, you know, throw out some some Bach out there in the universe and hope that they hear it. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of the I guess newer form of thought is that it's more of an interdimensional or sort of not even, but some type of different experience where we're where we are using different uh, compounds and things. So, thank you also for just bringing and driving that point a little forward because I I I always wanted to be an astrophysicist and I just ended up doing neuroscience and all, you know. But I always had my heart set on that. But in a way, I'm kind of excited because it, it, it we're hit, heading into a place where we can kind of do both. <laughs> yeah ways. yeah inner paths to outer space as rick strassman put yeah. it yes Definitely. does anyone want to ask any last question i have um, to go in a couple of minutes thoughts. so yeah i think people are just blown away <laughs> <laughs> i mean why not <laughs> so, or you can just have really cool uh conversations like this too if you uh, don't want to get high at work that you see i am um consciousness is the new frontier they're saying fantastic job oh fantastic talk yeah lots of people have such nice things to say in the comments so thank you yeah. okay well okay that's it thank you so so much yeah i'm disseminating your books internally so it's they're very good <laughs> and i'm Honestly, there's a lot of things, even as a neuroscientist, that I have to brush up on when I read it. I'm like, oh, it does that? Oh, how I forgot. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. And okay. uh, we'll see you in the Twitter sphere. So go follow him on Alien sure. Insect on Twitter and check out his Substack. And yeah, we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.